Hey everybody, Rose Matter here. Welcome to part six of my Higurashi When They Cry to Tower Garashi Let's Play. So it got real dark in the last episode and there is a small part of me that does not want to know any more about what Sadako is going through because it is, it's, man, rough. But of course, uh, I'm not going to stop playing. I want to know what's going on. I do and I don't, but... We're going we're gonna to press on, and I'm just going to have to mentally prepare myself for what we're going to learn. And I'm assuming that we are going to get into the Watanagashi Festival in this episode, which of course is when things really start to go off the rails. So let's see what horrible things will happen next. Let's just do this. The die of fate had been cast. Oh, right off the bat, the sad music. Great. Reporting to a public agency, which we'd been warned could instead result in something far worse for Sadako if we didn't have the evidence first. And just, just like that, had I failed, had I let my emotions get the better of me in that moment, maybe I should have stayed silent and left everything to Mion since she had been relatively calm. I remembered the punishment game where we had to badmouth Curry and how me saying anything would have made it worse and Sadako told us to leave the talking to her. Maybe it was the same thing here. I was impulsive, so maybe I should have just shut up and looked at the floor. <laughs> but it was too late to lament it. The die I had thrown wouldn't be coming back into my hands. All we could do was pray for something good to happen. This is the wrong game for that. <laughs>俺にできる精一杯。本当に俺が死に物狂いに精一杯だったら、佐都子を夕べのうちに連れ出して、どこかの廃屋にでも隠れてる。そうならなかったってことは、俺は精一杯じゃなかったってことだろう。もう考える
just in case they didn't get her to safety and decided to wait and see again. I need to take further measures. Oh, here we go. We've asked the people who could do something official already. Then there was one more place that was worth asking for help. She might laugh it off. Or I might be right, and I could be endangering my own life. But I try. Uh, Mio, there was an ominous meaning behind my words, so Mion realized what I really meant right away. I wanted to talk about something alone. That's what I meant. Rena already had her shoes on and was waving to us from the schoolyard. Mion's house was gigantic in every way imaginable. Let's hope that this uh, turns out better than the last time I was here. The house itself was a vaguely old-fashioned, traditional Japanese house, but the yard, I guess, or their plot of land, was enormous. It easily convinced me they really were major landowners, with Hinimizawa under their thumb. Mion brought me through the guest room, and a servant brought us some tea. Eh, <laughs> The servant left telling us it was five o'clock, then withdrew with soft footsteps. If you had the money to hire all these people, then just take Sadako in. I glared at her as I thought that, and Mion seemed to catch on immediately. Ah, it kind of looked like I was bullying her. Mion had been apologizing to me a lot lately. Was Mion the sort of person who would do that this much? Maybe it's just that I've been looking so grim lately. It's funny though, it's like in the last one she was such a force and she was so aggressive and now in this one she just seems very subdued. でさ。何ケイちゃん、なんか話があったんじゃないのミオンにかなり本気な話がある。突然な話でミオンは面食らうかもしれないが、聞いてほしい。え、何あ、先に逃げ道を渡しておくな。仮に本当だったとして、ミオはそれを認めてくれなくてもいい。What's At first, Mion looked like she had no idea what I was saying, but at hearing the whole sentence and putting it together, she reacted. I definitely couldn't tell her who told me. Oh, it was... Oh, she's talking about... Uh, oh, frick, what's her name? Takano? Takano-san, you told me not to, but please forgive me. God damn it! Oh, Keiichi! I knew it! I knew he was gonna... I knew it! When she said, don't tell anybody, don't talk to anyone about this, I knew he was gonna blurt his stupid face! Oh. This was why I asked you about it, after all. Kei-chan-ga-oni-ga-fuchi-mura-no-na-o-shitte-ru-koto-dake-demo-odoro-ki-dake-do-a-tashi-ni-tsui-te-i-ro-i-ro-to-a-ru-koto-nai-koto-sh
Is he saying that she's the one who's been um, orchestrating the murder? So, ooh, so maybe there isn't... It's not too far off the mark from what happened in the last chapter. けいちゃんが何の話をしようとしてるかわからないけど、話す前に釘を刺すよ。とにかくけいちゃんは大きな勘違いをしてる。だからできるなら、私はけいちゃんの話も聞きたくない。あ、we might see the me on from the last chapter. We'll see. 本当に聞くだけ。それでもいいね。あ。Mion seemed to know what kind of thing I'd be talking about. She warned me that doing so would be fruitless. That much was obvious. If what I was going to say was true, then the Sonozaki family would be the masterminds behind the string of freak deaths that have been occurring every year in Hinimizawa. おやしろ様のたたりってあるよな。Mion nodded a little. ショウタイ不明。なぜ起こるのかも不明。ここには解決しながらも全体で見れば不可解な連続開始、連続失踪事件。でも一つだけ共通することがある。それは必ず村の旧敵が標的に選ばれること。みたいだね。Mion spoke as if it didn't relate to her. That was fine. She didn't have to admit it. This really is giving me flashbacks to the last chapter. For now, I just wanted her to stay quiet and listen to me. Mion didn't answer. Her expression remained the same too. Like she said, she was just quietly listening. Mion gave me a look she'd never given me before, a far away look, a sympathetic one. She didn't nod, she just smiled faintly and listened to me. もしもことしのたたりがさとこのおじちゃんなかったならだってきょねはさとこのおばだろ順番から言えば決しておかしくはないだろそうだね。そういう順序もあるね。第一あいつ去年のたたりでおばが死んだ後、佐藤子を放り出して丸一年町に逃げ出してたじゃないか。そんなやつ、もろにおやしろ様のたたり確定じゃないかよ。今年のたたりに選ん
as, like, someone to carry out your will. For your own... I mean, not for his purpose. He's doing it for Sadako, but still. I wonder... It, yeah, it's just such a weird thing. It's like, it's... It, this is so much like Chapter 2, so there's definitely gonna be a swerve, right? Mion looks surprised for a while. She was dumbfounded. いきなり共犯宣言。ケイちゃん、かなり大胆だよ、それ。いいから話の腰を折るな。佐藤の叔父を今年の畳に。ケイちゃん、ストップ。そろそろご飯の準備をしたいから、今日はくれくらにしたい
そうだね謝っておいてくれるかな<笑>ミオン said she didn't have much time, but she still brought me to the gate. She said she had a meeting or something today about Sunday's Watanagashi festival, so there would be a lot of people from the town council and the festival committee coming. Despite her day being so busy, she still listened to what I had to say. See, this is the Mion that I like. Like, she's my favorite character, and this is. I like this one. Like, she's. She's just so good. ケイちゃんの強い思いは伝わるからあ今日は変な話をして本当にごめんな今日の話はなかったことにしてくれていいうん忘れておくよじゃあ明日なバイバイ Well, I hope she's not vindictive Mion like she was from the second chapter, all because Keiichi didn't give her a doll and then she got all weird. This one, I straight up accused her of being a murderer, and she's just like, all right, bygones be bygones, water under the bridge. We'll see. I had really only spent a short time with Mion. Talking to her made me think. It was clear that what Takano said had told me, at least, wasn't a complete fabrication. If Mion was really, really unconnected to the incidents, then she probably wouldn't have listened to me so quietly. She heard me out until I was done without making any quips, and I wanted to think that was proof. I did kind of feel like I was grasping at straws. Of course, thinking back on it, it was a terrible thing to discuss. I mean, I went to my friend's house, called her a serial murderer, and then told her to kill Sadako's uncle. <laughs> Man, when, when, uh, when Keiichi does something, he does something 110%. All this after Takano told her, told him not to say anything, and then the next day he goes and blurts to Mion about the rumors. Oh boy. Mion quietly listened to everything I had to say like a pastor listening to a confession. She could have gotten angry partway through, told me off, and to go wash my face in miso soup and come back later. But she didn't. Was that proof Mion's family, the Sonozaki, were the masterminds? Or was she just listening because she felt sorry for me, going kind of crazy? I didn't know which it was, but it was the one effort I could make at the moment. It was another form of insurance, should worse come to worse, and the public agency decided to wait and see. It was a completely useless resistance, literally grasping at straws. Sensei said that if she reported it to the child consultation center, they'd have to respond on the same day. Could they already be in the middle of responding to it now? If Sadako came to school tomorrow morning all energetic, then everything would be just a needless fear. Why couldn't tomorrow come faster? That night was unusually hot and humid, and I couldn't get to sleep. I said all that to Sensei. They couldn't possibly decide to wait and see again this year. Sadako, what was it like for her tonight? Had she tasted the end of her nightmare, enjoying a night of liberation? I actually put my hands together and prayed into my futon. Well, let's, let's see what happens. Here we go. おはようよかった今日もお寝坊かと思ったよ She's probably like I thought like I was afraid that you had gone to Sadako's house to kidnap her 昨日はおばさまには先に行ったって言われるし学校には来ていないし途中で日射病で倒れちゃったのかなって心配してたんだからへいへい昨日は心配かけて申し訳ございませんでしたグッドモーニングみーちゃんおはよう大丈夫なんかすっごく眠そうだよそういえば昨日は遅くまで町会の人が集まっての打ち合わせ会だったんだろ打ち合わせ会なんて名ばかりの宴会だよ毎年やってるお祭りだもん
今更小難しい打ち合わせなんかないし今日の午後はやっぱりお祭りのお手伝いに行くのかなうんバッチャの代わりにいろいろ挨拶しなきゃなんないしそれにね祭りってのは準備からもう始まってるからね Our morning conversation was lighthearted as usual. It looked like Mion had thankfully forgotten about how I barged into her house yesterday with that crazy talk. The more I think back on it, I felt like I'd really said something terrible to her. I was really thoughtless, and it wouldn't have been weird if she'd yelled at me. It was highly possible Takano san had exaggerated her story. To think our comrade and friend Mion, the young leader of the Sonazakis, one of the three families effectively controlling Hinemizawa, Was pulling the strings behind the serial death incidents was a little unbelievable. <laughs> sure. But if there was even a 1% chance that it was true, then what I said yesterday to Mion might have been a success. It was no more than one in a hundred, but that little bit of effort might have brought the chances of saving Sadako up by even a tiny bit. At least I'd made the effort. After yesterday ended, I was sure I'd done everything I possibly could. There was something else I could do. It was probably just to clap my hands and pray that Sadako's uncle would be, cur、uh, would be killed by the curse. Sadako, today is here. I have a feeling she's not. That's right. The teacher has done a lot. I have a feeling she's already dead. I don't know why I have that feeling, I just do. And that's horrible. Yes, I'm fine. I'm fine. ひなみざわ地区の民生委員が私のおばさんなんだけどさゆうべ電話して聞いてみたよへえみーちゃんのおばさんって民生委員さんなんだねそれでさとこちゃんのことなんて言ってたのうん先生があのあと直接沖の宮の生活相談所に電話してね担当の職員さんが昨夜のうちに訪問したらしいよ私のおばさんにも今後定期的にアプローチするようにと連絡があったって小難しい話はいいよそれより佐藤子はどうなったんだよ保護されたのかうーんおばさんはそこまでは知らされてなかったみたい本来はこういうのって秘密だからねおばさんが私に話してくれたのも十分に倫理違反なんだしさ I guess Keiichi's not the only one with loose lips. So, Kae to Huan in Atazo. Iko? Gakoni. Right. Discussing this more would just make us feel worse. It was far quicker to go to school and see if,、uh, and see if Sadako was safe or not. The three of us nodded and ran off. Was Sadako safe? What measures had the child consultation center taken? I didn't care what, as long as we could get back to our peaceful life with Sadako today, it didn't matter to me. At the shoe racks at the entrance, Rena took a peek in Sadako's shoe cubby. Oh! But I'm afraid of what she's gonna look like. We'll see. We trotted toward the classroom. The classroom was lively as it usually was in the morning. Sadako! How are you? Me. I'm here. 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 Back to normal, but we're, I can't assume anything yet. I mean, that, this is too good to be true. All our friends crowded around Sadako excitedly. She's not happy with us. She's gotta know it's us, cause we're all like. We know something happened. Sadako said, I told you I'm fine under her breath. 
She was still trying to overcome all the suffering on her own. みんな it's gonna be the thing where it's like the uncle's gonna let her go to school to kind of like, you know, sense of normalcy, and then once the visits stop happening, then it's just gonna go right back to how it is, and he's probably gonna get worse with her in private. <laughs> it's that cycle. Just like what happened last year. What was Sadako saying? <laughs> Oh, gosh. Tug. Rika Chan grabbed the back of my collar and pulled me away because she knows I'm about to say some dumb shit. Rika Chan silently dragged me all the way into the hallway. Rika Chan, what do you do? Sato Koa. なんでもないと言って追い返してしまいました。あい、バカ野郎。イディエット。That's だけど、監督に聞いた話じゃ、保護室ってのは本人の意思に関係なく緊急保護することができるんだろう。いくらサトコが虐待をしてしたって、虐待は事実。Chie-sensei finally came. Her expression was far from cheerful. ええ。前原君の言う通り、児童福祉士は緊急性があると判断すれば、職権で緊急保護をすることができます。当事者の意思に関係なく。じゃあどうしてどうしてサトコの意思が変に尊重されて保護されないことに。それに沖の宮の相談所もいろいろ検討した末にそういう判断を。なんだよそれ。そうですね。Basically like <笑> Jeez, KG, he's just snapping on everyone. Like I said, it's basically like, unless they show, unless they come in and they actively see him abusing her, I guess, it's just like, oh, well, I mean, we didn't see anything, and she looks like she's being fed, and, you know, she's not dirty and stuff, so everything seems to be okay? KG, the third time. Sensei tried to stop her, but Rika Chan went on speaking anyway. Oh. I'm stunned at the sudden revelation. I had no idea what Rika-chan wanted to tell me, but it seemed really important, so I couldn't get a word in either. Oh, don't tell me that her, her stepfather was abusive, too. Oh my god, Sadako. Satoshi was a good kid, one who listened politely to what adults told him. He was immediately welcomed by their new father and was loved. Oh no, but she wasn't. But Sadako was different. She was rebellious, she told lies, she played pranks. Her stepfather didn't like her at all. つまり、どういうことだよ。サトコは、おじ夫婦に預けられる以前の家族の時もあまり良好な家族関係ではなかったのです。of course, her stepfather didn't have any malicious intent at the start. 
At first, he must have worked hard to get his new daughter to accept him. But the young Sadako didn't make any effort at all towards that end. She was distant toward her stepfather, and never opened her heart to him even a little. She just got on his nerves all the time, with seemingly forced lies and pranks. Her father's discipline and punishment must have been loving at first, of course, but that too faded quickly. さとこちゃんが両親特に義理のお父さんを陥れるのを目的に嘘の話を作って自分で生活相談所に電話したの。What?自称と作りっぱなし。さとこは嫌いなお父さんを追い払うため嘘の電話をしたのです。Is oh this why they're not this is why this is why the child welfare is this why they're not taking it as seriously because they assume you know girl who cried wolf oh boy child well uh child welfare officers rushed there and heard the story her father genuinely apologized for a few times when he had gone too far and agreed to let the child welfare center give him coaching oh, so he wasn't that bad he was just Frustrated, but he wasn't malicious about it. She might have screwed herself over because of that now. Sadako's mother, there were a few times where she had lived with de facto husbands though those relationships didn't result in remarriage. From a young age, Sadako had been forced to call at least two or three people her father. At some point, Sadako's pranks escalated. She would spill food on purpose, turn over her plate, and even throw it. She would break the windows in the neighborhood and shoplift candy. Oh, so she's just like having outbursts and maybe they just see her as a problem child, so it's like they don't pay as much attention when things happen to her. She would put thumbtacks everywhere and set other traps to seriously hurt people. Not in the way she did now, just to get laughs. She was also fond of telling lies that would be found out right away, and people got mad at her every time. But she never ever changed her behavior. In regards to Sadako's problematic behavior, child psychology experts from public institutions indicated her actions were to draw her mother's attention to herself. They acknowledged that she had a form of harmful emotional trauma and declared that she needed counseling and therapy from professionals. They didn't know whether that therapy had healed the wounds in her heart. お父さんに虐待を受けているとね。自分で通報してお父さんを追い出そうとした。でも結局佐藤子をいじめてたわけだろ。その義父は。いいね。虐待の話は全部佐藤子ちゃんの作り話だった。義理のお父さんはもちろ
something's happening, but. That's just what I said, girl who cried wolf. The fable about telling a lie once, making others unwilling to believe you later. Neither Sensei nor Reika-chan had anything to say to that. Yeah, you gotta think about it. If Sadako was doing this again, she wouldn't chase the guy away. She would be jumping at the chance to get out of there. And Sadako dealt with them, put on the best, strongest smile she could manage and denied the abuse. Of course, she was probably being threatened to keep quiet about it by her uncle. Sadako was trying to outlast everything without asking for help. Sadako wanted to wait for Satoshi to come back home. And she outright denied the truth of the abuse. What an idiot. What? You're not really enduring it. Do you really think pretending like this will actually bring Satoshi back? Just stop it already. Satoshi, he, he abandoned you. And the fact that he hasn't shown up to save you now is proof, isn't it? I'm afraid Keiichi's gonna snap on Sadako and tell her, like, he's not coming back. You are being foolish. And then he's gonna break her promise about not, you know, to coach about not making her cry. And then she'll probably be like, you're not my Nini. My Nini would never yell at me like this. And there's gonna be some sort of fracture there and something's gonna happen. That's my guess of what's gonna happen. Because Keiichi just can't seem to keep his emotions in check, and he's probably going to snap on Sadako at some point. So just stop it. Please stop being weird and pretending to endure it. Oh, Chie, you are talking to the wrong person to keep their mouth shut. Unlike Mion, who actually seems to... She says she's going to forget something she does. Or at least she doesn't bring it up, but Keiichi's not going to do that. Especially if it has to do with Sadako. Chie-sensei gave me a warning, then left to go back to the teacher's lounge. Keiichi? Sadako no koto... ...kawai sou na ko nante... ...omuwanai de kudasai desu. Sadako wa... ...si... ...Sadako wa... ...sonna no wakatteru! Ore tachi no... かけがえのない仲間だ。佐藤子はまだ頑張っています。もう少し見守ってあげましょうです。相談所の人が今後も定期的に訪問すると言ってるのです。大変なことになったらすぐに助けてくれますよ。大変なことになった後だろ。any more than that would have sounded like I was picking a fight, so I firmly swallowed my next words and went back to the classroom. There you go, Keiichi. You can actually show some self-restraint. Mion and Rena were talking to Sadako like they always did. It was a silly conversation. A humorous, even fun one, like it was any old day. If, if Sadako really said she could still endure it, then maybe I should do as Rika-chan said and watch over her. Maybe whatever help I offer will just go unwanted. Oh boy. And then Watanagashi is happening probably pretty soon, I imagine. And then we'll just have to wait and see what happens next. Oh my god. Did not think I'd hear this music again.
Sadako brought her own desk over as well, uh, grinning broadly. Even knowing nothing had been resolved, this exchange was pleasant and made me remember how fun it used to be. It's like the game's like, we'll give you a little bit more of something happy before we take it all away from you. Reika-chan's such a good girl. Having such a good friend must be so reassuring. I take it back. Well, hmm. She's Rika-chan after all. ほら、ほら、お見事なお手前でございましたよ。いつお嫁に行ってもおかしくないお手前ですわね。お、お、お嫁、お嫁、お嫁。お嫁を食べると。はあ。え、何お嫁は NG ワードだね。囲碁控え
At some point, her body had been covered in a thin layer of sweat, and her breathing had turned ragged. When I pet her head, did she not like it? Was that what it meant? Once again, slowly, I held out the palm of my hand and brought it close to Sadako's head. The instant the palm of my hand touched her head, there was a shock like static electricity, and Sadako began to howl. I was just about to compare it's like an abused dog. It's like if you just touch them, and they just start to shake. And and I don't want to compare Sadako to a dog, but it's just like, it's that thing of just like, Ew, this is really icky, and I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. Oh. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. I hate this. Thud, slam. She grabbed my arm in both hands, as if flinging off a snake trying to cling to her, as if trying to throw some uh, away something dirty, she threw it violently. It happened too suddenly for me to react. I hit the desk behind me, and both it and I fell to the floor. The classroom fell deathly silent. As Sadako bellowed, it sounded like she was in the throes of death, and she unsteadily backed away. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Then she threw up the food she had just eaten. She vomited it all back up. Splish splat. The sound of Sadako's vomit hitting the floor rang throughout the classroom. <laughs> I reached out a hand and she swatted it away with all her might. With such extreme strength, I fell onto the floor again. Sadako put both hands on her head as though protecting it, groaned some more, and took a few steps back. And then she began swinging both hands around. Students in nearby seats were forced to evacuate. Oh my god, like... Oh, this must have been after the, uh... The, um, officer left, because, like... I mean, we saw Sadako just a couple of days ago, and she was not like this, so he, the uncle really must have ramped it up. She grabbed anything within reach, bento boxes, chairs, threw them, tossed them, and flung them about. She screamed out as Mion's words had caused her physical pain. No one spoke a word to her. All the students were withdrawing behind us, leaving Sadako alone in the corner of the classroom. Around her, there were desks and chairs all over the floor. Bento lay scattered. It was terrible. All I could hear was Sadako's ragged breaths and the voices of the cicadas. <laughs> oh my gosh, the strings of tension loosened around Sadako. And maybe she suddenly grew scared of her own actions because she started trembling and gave a word of apology. But nobody knew just who that apology was directed towards. So for now, I decide to answer as everyone's representative. Please let this be enough for them to, like, take this seriously. Like, this is clearly an outburst from being touched because something, like, she's being abused. Hmm. <laughs> Our words didn't match. Our words didn't match each other at all. Sadako hugged her shoulders and back, back she went. Bang. She ran to the locker with the cleaning supplies in it. Even that made her give a little yelp. The impact caused the bucket atop the locker to fall, making a loud sound, and that scared Sadako most of all. She almost jumped out of her skin, grabbing a bunch of the curtains in her hand. Nobody spoke to her. They could only look, not even remembering to blink. <laughs> Sadako, what? What on earth? I stood up, took a step away from everyone, and approached Sadako.
落ち着けよサトコ俺がわかるかもうやだもうやだやですやです<笑> oh, I hate this too that little screech she does that is like ah、oh, it's not like her whining you know her old crying when she would do the fake crying to get you know sympathy like this is like oof every time I took a step forward she grasped the curtains more tightly and cried out サトコ俺だよケイチだわかんないのかお前に危害なんか加えない Now, where's the teacher? Like, the teacher must have heard this. Like, she's literally flinging desks around. Like, is the teacher not gonna come in hearing a crying Sadako and, like, things being thrown around? Like, come on, girl, where are you? Suddenly, my shoulders were grabbed and I was dragged backward. It was Rena. After pulling me back, she ran towards Sadako in my place. Maybe it's because I'm a man and maybe he, she needs a girl there. Maybe right now, like anyone who is a boy is. Is danger. No. I mean, come on, they cannot ignore this. Like, they, 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 of course, there's no teacher to see this, but there's witnesses. Like, they, they have to step in now. Like, this is clearly something. Like, she's got to go see. Uh, immediate, like, psychological examination right now. Like, this is bad. <laughs> As she gripped the curtains and kept calling for Nini, she continued to wail about being forgiven for something and to be saved from something. What? What is this? Oh, I wonder if the uncle. I wonder if the uncle, like, you know, you called the. You know, you called the cops just like you did with your stepfather, and now I'm gonna punish you. What is this? <laughs> Mio gnashed her teeth and groaned, and there were tears falling from her firmly closed eyes. <laughs> Crash. There was a crazy sound. Rena had taken the cleaning supply locker and kicked it down to the ground. Everyone stood surprised at Rena's unexpected act of brutality. After that, Rena embraced the bawling Sadako from behind and started crying with her stifled. Rena, どうした Keiichi, be quiet for a minute, for once. Oh, there she goes. There we go. Rena's raw, hostile emotion hit me like a brick. It was no more than a momentary howl of emotion for Rena, but it was more than that for me. She had shown me what was behind all that emotion, what was in her heart. I'm actually crying right now.
I just have to take a second. Forgive us for being unable to do anything. Rana's words made me feel as though the blood vessels in the back of my head were suddenly all turning to ash. My vision grew distant, blurred with gray, and the world lost its color. I thought, I thought we could save Sadako. But though I knew it'd be the sooner the better, I thought there was no time limit for doing that. I never even dreamed that we could be too late. I'd been making a huge uh, mistake. I thought Sadako could be hurt, but never that she'd break. It was such a huge mistake. People, they break. Thinking that they don't is absolutely absurd. We needed, uh, we needed to save Sadako. We needed to save her before she broke. That fatal lapse in awareness had brought this on. Whose fault was it? That went without saying. Mine. No. Ours. We all took on the duty of saving Sadako, but we were neg uh, negligent to the point of laziness. In that sense, this was the inevitable result. Even if this didn't happen today, and it happened tomorrow, or the day after, or next week, we would have just sat around doing nothing until that day. So this, this was the obvious result. I know there's nothing I could have done, but it feels like this gray thing. It feels like I, this is like a choice I made and I got like a bad ending. It's like if, if it was a choice, like, uh, tell someone now or wait and see. And I chose tell someone now and then I got the bad end, but there's nothing I could have done. This is just the way that the story goes. I slumped down to my knees, just as Mion and Reika-chan had done. And I, too, closed my eyes tight, and I couldn't stop myself from sobbing. Thanks for showing up, Chie. The teacher came, and her face screwed up at the terrible spectacle before her. The instant she realized the teacher was here, Sadako went through another complete change. She wiped her face with the curtains, and like nothing happened, smiled. Oh,お嬢さん。これは一体何事ですか？ちょっとレナさんと喧嘩になってしまっただけですのよ。お弁当をめぐってちょっぴり大暴れなんですの。ね。Rena didn't nod in reply, but then since Sadako wished it, she nodded without strength. The rest of the class couldn't keep up with her extreme changes. We all just stared in a daze. Sadako would probably sweep the whole thing under the rug. For what? Her heart is torn to pieces, so what? What else? You wanted your Nini to help, didn't you? But unfortunately for you, Satoshi doesn't ever intend on coming back. It's never that easy. He won't just conveniently show up and save you. So you don't have to wait for him anymore. You can cry, beg for help, and you can run away. <laughs> Mion suddenly said. She spoke then, those few words that tormented me countless times. Those words were a spell, and when I heard them, my whole body suddenly regained its calm. My emotions all slipped away like they'd never been there. Like a wave departing. Oh shit. And then the world's color flipped inside out. What is this music? My field of view expanded. My head grew remarkably cold and I felt like my mind's volume had grown even wider than the classroom we were in. He's gonna go kill the uncle, isn't he? He's gonna be like, if if the curse isn't gonna do it, if Mion's not gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. At the time, my soul was doubtlessly no longer in the small, petty vessel of my head but floating in the air a little bit above it. It was a mysterious feeling of release. I broke free of the cramped confines of my skull and stretched out my roots in all directions, as far as I wanted to. It was a strange feeling, and one I'd never felt before. An odd sense of exhilaration. My sharpened senses caused me to transcend. My mind was sharper than a knife's edge, and I immediately decided that spending the time to let myself be crushed with grief would be an absolute waste. 
I erased all the garbage information from my brain. I expelled the pointless emotions presenting obstacles to action. Neil. He's like, yep, he's d he's he's gonna kill the uncle. He's yep. Keiichi, his mind just that sound was his mind snapping. <laughs> there there's no need for for a curse or for the that stuff to mess with him. He's he's gone. He's gone. If I could have taken back what had happened by crying about it, I'd have cried all day. But the fact was, this was how things had turned out. I couldn't take back what had happened. The top priority then would be to prevent a situation from worsening further and to sever the chains of misfortune. Until today, I'd been looking at things so narrow-mindedly I could scarcely believe it. To save Sadako, the only thing to do was to save Sadako. That's the only thing I thought about. I didn't allow myself to realize the most basic, direct, and certain way of removing the source of Sadako's unhappiness. Actually, I realized it yesterday. But as for the means, I relied on some stupid curse from some dumb deity. I never considered carrying out the task myself. Oh, it's coming to this, eh? I've been talking about it and talking about it, but uh, I didn't think it was actually maybe gonna happen. I would obliterate Sadako's uncle. There were plenty of ways to do it. This was a task that had held infinite methods. Ironically, the method of saving Sadako required mostly money. But the method of killing that man pretty much took no money at all. I could kill him with the least amount of investment. The least amount of money suited him. It was only the weight of his life. I kept eliminating needless, worthless information from my head, replenishing it with only the knowledge I need to achieve my goal. I used every cell in my brain to think about how I'd kill him. The way I killed him didn't matter. I would allow any method from whatever time and whatever country, as long as it ended in a quick and certain death. If I were to have an additional condition, it would be to not get caught. Removing him was an act designed to return the peaceful times we had had with Sadako. If I were arrested in exchange for the removal, then we might as well have killed each other. With only him gone, we'd go back to our normal lives. That was my supreme objective. My ultimate goal. Kill him, definitely. But definitely don't leave evidence either. Two alternatives at odds with one another. The condition of not leaving a trace back to me automatically narrowed the number of method mi uh, murder methods. No witnesses was an absolute must. Fortunately, given the right time in Hinimizawa, there would be nobody around. Oh, he's gonna do it during... He's gonna do it during the festival, so people are gonna think it's the curse. I mentally reconstructed the land around Sadako's house. The number of pedestrians, different at different times. The movement algorithm of the neighbors. Would I lure him out or charge at him? What would my weapon be? When and where would I carry this out? Where? It needed to be somewhere I wouldn't leave a trace. When? It needed to be as soon as possible for Sadako's safety without wasting even a millisecond. Okay, so maybe he's not gonna wait for the festival. This is absurd. Completely absurd. When I thought about it this way, it struck me how easy the act of killing was. If I could leave evidence, if I was just going to kill him, anyone could easily turn into a murderer. But our reason prevented that. It told us doing so would get us arrested for sure. In the end, being arrested by the police was the final thing preventing people from committing homicide. Absurd. If you went all the way out into the very middle of the ocean, you wouldn't leave any trace at all. Anyone would drop those they hated into the depths if they knew that. It was all too easy to simply remove him. I could leave class right now, grab a metal baseball bat or something from the schoolyard, go to his house and attack him. And the baseball bat always comes back in the chapters as well, doesn't it? Estimated time would be 25 minutes. If I wanted to kill, uh, if I wanted us to kill each other, it wouldn't even be minutes. I could do it in 1500 seconds. I knew just how much his continued existence depended on me. He was nothing. I could expel him from this world with just 1500 seconds after making up my mind. From when I decided what to do, he only had 1500 seconds. Actually, if I ran full speed to his house, that number would go down even farther. But he was alive. He was still part of this world at this very moment, having torn Sadako's body and mind to shreds. Why? Because I was letting him live. I was permitting him to live so he was alive. 
If I rescinded that permission, he would be evacuating this mortal coil within 1500 seconds. It's so creepy, he just keeps repeating 1500 seconds specifically. Keiji, if you, if you left right now and the uncle mysteriously turned up dead, I think people would know who did it. Even if you did it, you know, in the dead of night, you know, maybe even during Watanagashi, I think people would still have the suspicions because you have been touting the horn more than anyone. Talking to Takano about the uncle, talking to Mion about the uncle, wanting to kill him. You think I'd let you live to breathe even 1,500 more seconds of air? I'm taking that permission back, right here, right now. You'd better thank me for letting you live until today. However, I actually need more than 1,500 seconds. I'm not just going to end you. Getting back our old lives is far more important. It's only you I'll be cleanly cutting out of this world. They won't find a culprit. I'll forget that I dirtied my hands on the likes of you as naturally as I brush my teeth before bed. So to do that, I'll make a special exception for you and give you more than 1,500 seconds. I'll give you special permission to keep on living as you have until I constru construct the perfect plan for your murder. Wait, Keiichi. You can't let that time go to waste. I, yeah, I know. I'll kill him quickly. I'll remove him with certainty. I won't misuse any time to think of a plan. Oh gosh, he's like arguing in his own brain. Not about whether to kill or not to kill, but when to kill. Like, he's set on killing. It's just a matter of, do I do it right now or do I wait? Think back. Tomorrow is Watanagashi, isn't it? Last year on the night of Watanagashi, her aunt, uh, her aunt died. Her head was busted open by some deviant and her brain splattered everywhere. That's it. He's someone who deserves to be given death on the night of Watanagashi. Hey, Oishiro-sama. You call yourself a guardian, but you didn't protect Sadako. Cursing Sadako's family for the damn stuff is your own business. But now you've made Sadako unhappy when she didn't have anything to do with it. I, Keiichi Maibara, hereby denounce you, the guardian deity of Hinimizawa, a failure. We don't need you. Go back to the deepest, darkest part of your shrine this year. Besides, you had just cursed and killed both her aunt and uncle last year. None of this would have ever happened. The curse this year, it's not on you. I'll be the one deciding. It won't be the three families controlling the serial deaths behind the scenes. No, not some vague people who I can't tell if they're buffoons or not. This time, I'll be the one to deliver divine judgment. So don't get in my way, just watch. Stay quiet and watch. I'll obliterate him. I'll wipe him off the face of the earth. I will stomp out his very existence. Go away, disappear, and die. I'll tear your heart apart just like you did to Sadako. I'll have your blood as payment. Whoa! <laughs> and all that was in his head and everyone is just staring at him. Rena, Mion, and Rika-chan were looking after me. Had I fallen to the floor? Oh shit, oh shit, okay, oh, Keiichi. No, it's, now it's Keiichi's turn to be scary. Reno was scary before, now it's Keiichi. Damn. <laughs> She's like, alright, are we gonna get into it right now, you and me? We're gonna see who can be scarier? I still have my, uh, my money on Rena. My friends gave a start and backed away. Ren and the others, they exchanged glances unsure of what to say and stood confused for a few moments. So I know... I know that the, the, this demon thing is probably not real. And I know every time like when the eyes get all weird, that's not actually them being possessed. But it, I feel like it almost feels like when Mion got... Like when she was the way she was in the last chapter and then Rena in the first chapter when they just got all weird and it seemed like they were being possessed. That's what it feels like with Keiichi right now. It feels like he's just been possessed. <laughs> Rena gulped firmly and opened her mouth. Oh, so it did. It happened to Keiichi. Me? Shikari's kakudo de so mietan daro. Baka baka shi. Mi, mi machigai janai yo. Anna me. 
It's worth being on the... On the other end of it. What were these guys talking about? They've all been too scared of me lately. And it's kind of funny having it be the, like the flip side where I'm the one freaking people out rather than me being freaked out. What was Rena saying? Who else do I look like except Keichi Maibara? The look I gave her seemed to speak quite eloquently to those irritated thoughts. She understood and quickly apologized. Oh my gosh. Oh, what am I in for? What is going to happen? <sighs> Emergency, that doesn't sound good. June 18th, 1983. Abuse issues regarding Sadako Hojo. Urgent. We propose that Sadako Hojo must be taken into immediate custody based on the items below. 1. Family situation. Life with adoptive father who recently returned to Hinamizawa has already turned disastrous and she is currently subject to unendurable physical and mental abuse from the father. 2. Child Consultation Center's response. A child probation officer was dispatched yesterday on the 17th from the Prefecture Welfare Office, but because of the 77 case, changed to continued coaching and cautionary action. Unfortunately, the consultation office head does not properly understand the situation. 3. Status of concerned child. Child already appears to be suffering from an outbreak of something close to neurosis or manic depression. So I'm wondering... Who is sending this? Is this, is this, um, Chie? Is this maybe Mion? It's like, I know that Sadako was pretending to be fine in front of Chie. Maybe, hopefully, someone pulled her aside and told her what happened. And maybe Chie is sending a thing being like, guys, this is really serious. We need to get her out of there. If her unstable, pubescent mind is negatively stimulated by stress, it will put her development of a healthy body and mind at risk. This cannot be allowed to continue from a humane standpoint. Like, this sounds like this is coming from an adult. This doesn't sound like this is coming from, like, KG or Mion. So, hopefully, someone will step in. Four, allegations made to the family court. We propose, based on the above items, that Sadako Hojo should immediately be taken into protective uh, custody. She should be secured temporarily under emergency allegations to the family court under Article 28. We request emergency coordination between all related agencies. Uh, well, I mean, at least somebody is, you know, noticing that this is really serious now and hopefully something will be done, but I have my doubts. Fukush uh, Fukujisho D23 number 44, blank 1977. Child name, Sadako Hojo, blank years old. Residence, blank, Hinimizawa Village, Shishibone. Consultation circumstances. Telephone SOS from child of child abuse. Abuse situation. Child claims she's being physically abused by her adoptive father. Family structure, circle marks abusers. Adoptive father, real mother, older brother, child in question. Note, adoptive father and real mother entered family registry in 19 blank. The child is the daughter of the mother's previous husband. Child Consultation Center's response. On the day of the child's telephone consultation, the center called the child's school and asked of her situation. On that day, the child welfare officer on duty visited the child's house and conducted an interview. The adoptive father sincerely listened to instruction and agreed to take child-raising workshops in the city from now on. As part of the suggested coaching, the center will continue to observe the situation. Other notes. As a result of numerous counseling sessions at the city's education consultation office regarding the child, we learned there was a high possibility the cause of the child's excessive distrust towards her adoptive father was the result of lack of communication. The abuse she claimed hadn't actually taken place. She had made a false uh, report to distance herself from her adoptive father. Below was a note written in pencil by the person on duty at the time. 
The problem appeared to be more with the daughter. Chief Investigator F. of the city's Education Consultation Office said that most of her stories of abuse were likely fra uh, fabrications. They decided to shift the focus of their coaching to the child. Be cautious not to take everything the child says as truth. Oh, there's that dichotomy between, you know, I'm wondering, it's like, so you've got this and you've got this about how this one here, Sadako lied, so they say, be careful what she says, and then this one is like, no, 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 this is true. Oh boy, all right, let's, let's get back into this. I wonder if I'm actually going to get to Watanagashi in this episode, I don't know, maybe not. That's not my concern right now. My concern is uh, Sadako and Keiichi, like, what's going to happen? Mion and the others have uh, having to set up for the Watanagashi Festival or something. Invited me along, but I refused. Of course I did. Oh my god, is he going to do it right now? How could they be taking it easy and setting up for a festival in this situation? Mion had a lot of nerve. The first thing I did when I got back was take a shower. Not because I wanted to wash off sweat. It was because I wanted to be even calmer. I already understood this, but killing that man would be so very easy. The really hard thing would be not getting arrested for it, so we could get our peaceful days back. As I thought about it, I realized it wasn't easy. Japan's police force have the highest arrest rate in the world. I would need to deceitfully pull off the perfect crime, and it couldn't be a half-hearted attempt. Still, it wasn't 100%. Even the best police force in the world couldn't have a 100% arrest rate. I've read a lot of articles on trials with people brought up on false charges. They do a lot to determine whether they were really false accusations, but figuring out who the real criminal was is usually out of the question. And that meant perfect crimes did exist. In fact, perfect crimes were sort of like works of art. They could even be respected and revered. Oh my gosh. I was hoping he would say I wanted to take a shower to calm down and calm my mind and think things through, but uh, he seems pretty set on it. You just had to look at the uh, inundation of mystery novels everywhere throughout history. They dealt with all sorts of difficult-to-solve incidents involving secret rooms and alibis and stuff, but they all wanted to show one thing. They wanted to show the beauty of a perfect crime. There was something divine in the flawlessness of the word perfect. Yes. Perfect crimes were skills of the gods. And in that sense, the serial freak deaths they were calling the curse of Oishiro-sama. I understood. They must have been the works of gods. Each one appeared to have been resolved, but they couldn't stop it from happening every year. Yeah, skills belonging only to gods. Those are perfect crimes. And I would be setting up my own crime before Oyashiro saw a series of perfect crimes four years in the running. If I were to put it boldly, I was challenging a god. Foolhardiness would be needed to make the decision, but I needed to be calm, cool, colder than ice to put that plan together. Kill him like a flame, but as systematic as ice. Starting now, I need to retain both of those ideas within me. Modeling my crime after a mystery novel wasn't actually a bad thing to focus on. Sometimes kidnappings involving disturbing original methods that made it into the newspaper were used as basis for novels after the person was arrested. Stuff like that made it into the news. Day and night, for a very long time, mystery novel authors polished and refined their most fantastic artistic crimes. Imitating that could be a shortcut to planning the perfect crime in a short period of time. Of course, I haven't read enough mystery novels to act all high and mighty about them. The one who really liked mystery novels was my mom. She'd read every well-known mystery novel from overseas, from past and present. Every time she watched mystery shows, she would always criticize them as having cheap tricks or being poorly thought out. I wonder what the perfect crime would mean to her. Oh, this isn't going to be suspicious. <laughs> hey, mom, how do I pull off a perfect crime? And then... This guy dies, you know, like a couple days later, though she doesn't know the whole situation going on with Sadako, but still, suspicious. It is a random thing to ask of someone who apparently has no interest in these types of things until today. Yes. 
It's just so interesting. It's like in the other two chapters, it was trying to figure out who the murderer was, whereas in this one, we may know it, and it could be us. It wasn't like I was asking for my own amusement. She was deflecting the question, so I would somehow butter her up first and draw, uh, draw out an answer. そうね。よくできた推理小説。うーん。結構どれもこれもいろんな魅力があって、どれが面白かったとは言いにくいけど、強いてあげれば。母さんの好きな小説のタイトルが知りたいんじゃないよ。母さんが一番下を巻いた完
この事件はねおじいさんが殺されているのが見つかって初めて木を迎えるのよもしもこのあと誰もおじいさんの家を訪れなかったら永久に木は訪れない The beginning would never occur. だからつまり物語は始まらない事件が発覚しないから探偵も呼ばれないそもそも誰も不審に思わないから謎も起こらないおじいさんは今日も一人でのんびり森の奥で暮らしているんだろうねでお空におじいさんの顔が浮かんで「ジエンド」のこんな感じですすごいじゃないかそれちゃんとしたトリックだよでも娯楽小説にはならないわね推理小説は所詮娯楽書完全犯罪の指南書にはなりえないんだから I was trying hard to talk,、uh, talk cheerfully to fool her but inside I was excited Special tools, strange geography,、uh, geography, mysterious drugs, traps involving huge sums of cash. None of them was needed for perfect crimes. The important thing was that there wasn't a beginning. As long as the incident didn't come to light, it would be fine. Speaking broadly, if I could kill him without anyone finding out, and dispose of the corpse somewhere no one can find, it would basically already be a perfect crime. Of course, if someone up and vanished one day all of a sudden, People would get suspicious. But that didn't apply to this man. Yeah, yeah, just like I said. Last year after their aunt died, he ran away from the village in fear of Oishiro sama. When the night of Watanagashi came around again, everyone would have to think that he ran away in fear again. I mean, he had been living with a lover of his in town. No matter what it felt like when he vanished, no one would be suspicious. People hated him after all. No one would care where he went if he disappeared. When I thought about it like that, it got easier and easier to imagine killing him. There was no point in thinking inside my house anymore. I left getting my bike out of the garage. For now, it didn't matter where I was going. I just rode through the wind, trying to calm my excitement by feeling the cool air on my body. Where I'd kill him, how I'd do it, what time, and how to dispose of the corpse. If I just had those four things, I could get a good plan going. I was so surprised at how little there was to decide that I shivered. I'd been completely prepared to build this humongous plan over a really long period of time. But if I could just get these little things in order, I could put it into motion. Today was Saturday. I would have to kill him on the night of Watanagashi, so as long as I was standing in for Oishiro sama, I only had 24 hours remaining. Sadako. Just hang on for 24 more hours. Please, Sadako, please don't die. I, I keep saying that I, I'm expecting her to die before Watanagashi, before this can even be pulled off, and I, I just don't want that to be true. I, I don't, of course, I don't expect a happy ending from this, but I just want her to live. I, I totally expect Keiji to die, no matter what, each chapter, but I just want her to live. I can't even imagine having to suffer through even more, but please hold out for a little longer. I know you can't even last another second. I know that. But please just hold out. Your Nini will save you for sure. Outside, it was still early enough for the cicadas to be crying. Early afternoon. Evening was still a long way off. I looked at the sky. At some point, it had gotten cloudy. What's this music? What is this? Ooh. This is different. Come to think of it, as I left the house, I heard on the TV that the weather forecast was calling for a chance of rain on Sunday. The sky was the color of lead. If I heard a little bit of thunder, I'd definitely have expected a sudden evening shower. My first destination was school. Before explaining why I was going there, I needed to explain what method for killing that man I had decided upon. I decided the most suitable death, the one I needed to give him. Was the same as last year's curse. Oh, the baseball bat. He's going to go get the baseball bat. The same as the punishment their aunt had received, being beaten to death. Wouldn't beating him to death be somewhat unreliable? You may think that stabbing him with a blade would be more reliable, but this was something I'd chosen after a lot of thought. You just need to think realistically. 
in the law, it prohibited carrying any blades longer than 10 centimeters, I think. So the blades available to me, though long enough, were limited to things shorter than a ruler. You can probably understand how tricky it would be with such a short reach to go up against an opponent that might fight back. Plus, I've heard time and time again that uh, never, never fight someone with a knife because you are as likely to stab yourself or get stabbed as you are to stab the other person. In that case, using a weapon with reach would be far more effective. This music is so weird, it's like some hellish Animal Crossing music. Like, I, don't, I don't even know how to place it, like, it's so weird. It might not be the same precision, but you just had to hit the guy until you killed him. Both options resulted in death. With that settled, what is the weapon with the most terrifying force behind it that is also easy to carry around? By this point, you should immediately think of a metal baseball bat. I don't need to explain how terrifying a metal baseball bat can be as a weapon. Special note is the fact you can carry one around in broad daylight and not be thought of as suspicious. Except in the first chapter where he just started carrying the bat around, everyone was like, this is weird. It's like people are going to notice him just walking around with a baseball bat, having never really had, um, you know, any interest in baseball. But then again, he did play baseball earlier in this chapter, so maybe he could get away with it. Just those two points would have been enough to choose a metal bat for my weapon. But there was one more reason for choosing a metal bat in particular. I will speak about it later. It's so weird too that he's like talking to the audience directly. Like, I'll tell you later what, what my plan is. After school that Saturday, my classmates were still having fun playing in the schoolyard. I could show up there and it would be the same as always, so nobody would think I'm suspicious. Getting my hands on the weapon without looking suspicious was actually a factor I couldn't ignore. I didn't normally play baseball, so if I went to a sports store looking for a metal bat, it would definitely be suspicious. I can't let there be a beginning to the story, so I needed to be really careful even about that. That left school. At a location where my appearance wouldn't be suspicious, I would acquire the weapon. I checked inside the classroom through the window, but of course there was nobody there. The only students who would stay in there were me and the others when doing club activities. Without us, the classroom after school was just an empty, unused room. Without glancing around nervously, as if I'd gone to get something I'd forgotten, I casually went into the entrance. It looked like the teacher was busy with paperwork in the teacher's lounge. I didn't see her in the hallway. Naturally, yet quickly as a shadow, I entered the classroom. The empty room was full of a strange, stagnant air you couldn't feel normally. An empty classroom with nobody here. Maybe while no one was around, the desks creep about of their own accord, licking the floors clean of dirt. If I suddenly stepped into a place like that, would the desks in their surprise fly at me, crush my bones, and eat me alive? I felt regret at wasting valuable time thinking on stupid delusions. I'm too busy thinking about murder to think about silly things. The students' lockers were lined up in the back of the classroom. The one I was looking for wasn't my own. Oh, that's the other reason. It's Satoshi, so he's using Satoshi's bat as like, kind of like a divine punishment. It was a forbidden locker. One I had accidentally discovered one day. If one person had one locker, then why would Sadako have two? I'd made a fuss about it once. After that, I learned it was Satoshi's locker, and he had the same last name as her. But of course, even though it was a locker for a student no longer here, looking inside it was still a shameless act. But one time, I let my curiosity get the better of me and took a peek inside. Inside, it was average and worthless. At the time, I hadn't been interested, so until now, I'd forgotten what had been in it. But now that I had, dare I say, awakened, I remembered the thing that had been there. Scrape. I opened the locker and a stench of mold and sweat wafted out like a gym storehouse that hadn't been cleaned in weeks. My face puckered up at the stench, but I looked for it. Yes. Satoshi was on Coach's baseball team. Inside the locker was a Hinimizawa fighter's uniform, and it. The one Satoshi used. The metal bat. Yes. This was the reason I wanted to choose this bat. This murder would be carried out by me, but this wasn't originally my role, it was Satoshi's. But I would stand in for him and call myself Sadako's Nini. It was one of the rules for standing in for him. 
I reached for the metal bat and grasped it firmly. It was light, and yet its tip had enough heft in it, enough to easily imagine the horror if I brought it down with all my might. Satoshi, I'll give you one last chance to save your sister. Lend me your strength. You're a coward, but I will stand in for you. So if you still care even a little bit about her, you will lend me your strength. There is no more suitable weapon in the world for putting that man to death than your bat. Now I just needed to figure out where to hide it. Tomorrow before the act, I would just stop by the school and grab it. Because I couldn't ignore the possibility someone would see me bringing it home and thinking it was strange. But if I left it here, there wouldn't be a problem. Plus, tomorrow was Sunday. Not only that, it was the day of the biggest festival in the whole village. Nobody would be coming to school. I left out the entrance and went over to a construction vehicle parked nearby. We'd been warned by our teachers not to touch it just for laughs, so none of the kids would come near the vehicle either. They wouldn't because if she found out they touched it, they'd be in huge trouble. I quietly hid it, in the shadow of the vehicle. The chances of someone operating the vehicle tomorrow were slim to none. Because tomorrow was Sunday. Government workers had the day off. And from what my classmates had said, the thing had been left there for years now. Machines that haven't been moved in years, you can't just suddenly start them up again. So I was almost definitely fine in this case. The sunlight was piercing hot. My head grew faint for a moment. Had the heat been this harsh for the entire day? A moment of dull thoughts like this was a moment of carelessness. I gave myself a couple hits in the head and looked around warily. Okay. Next, how to dispose of the corpse. Okay, all right. This is this is going to happen, huh? He's he's really going to do it. Disposing of the corpse. The ultimate way not to create a beginning was to not let the corpse be found. It was even more important than killing him. Thinking on it vaguely, the first thing that came to mind was the swamp. Onigafuchi, the dreadful bottomless swamp revered even now that appeared in the legends of Onigafuchi village. Yes, the swamp called Onigafuchi was here first, and then the village took its name to become Onigafuchi village. In other words, the swamp was the origin of Onigafuchi village. No one, no matter who it was, would float back to the surface of this bottomless swamp. Everyone would be swallowed down to the land of the demons below the earth. That was how the stories went. If I was trying to copy Oishirosama's curse, then I felt the theory demanded I discard the, uh, the remains and the weapon into the swamp. But they may have said it's bottomless, but I didn't actually know. And people say large creatures like humans produce a lot of gas when they rot, granting a lot of buoyancy. It was why using fairly heavy objects to hold people down didn't work. Come to think of it, with the curse the year before last, Rikichan's mother drowned herself in the swamp. And the criminal behind the dismemberment that went missing the year of the first curse, too. It was rumored he tried to discard the body in the swamp and accidentally drowned in it. I never heard of the corpse coming back up or them finding it. Then shouldn't I choose to discard the corpse there, too? I could discard the weapon there. And then, for example, if her uncle came out on a motorcycle and attacked, it would be convenient to get rid of the bike, too. I knew Sadako's uncle generally used a motorcycle for transportation. But as for the corpse... After a lot of worrying, I decided not to discard the corpse in the swamp. The drowning suicide and accident were both rumors. Nobody knew if they'd actually happened. There were no lack of false rumors about the drowning suicide anyway, and it was possible the murderer hadn't drowned there and was still on the run. That meant no one had ever confirmed a corpse being dropped in there and then not coming back up. Then what would I do with the body? I thought it might be interesting to go with the first incident. Cut him to pieces and hide him. But the preparation and work for dismembering a human body would be di uh, difficult given the amount of time I had. He's talking about it so systematically like he's done this before. But I bet you once he gets to that moment... Because he's still a teenager. He's still, you know, a, a normal person. I imagine he's going to go and freeze up at the, you know, at... Like, he's thinking about it, and it's easy to think about it, but when you're actually there and you see the person, especially someone who's bigger than you, 
it's gonna be a lot harder, so I imagine maybe he'll freeze up and maybe he'll get killed instead by the uncle? I don't know. With that out of the question, I arrived at the conclusion to go with the more orthodox method of burying the body. Then where would I bury it? Was a question related to where I would kill him. Of course, I wanted to keep my time and proximity to the body at a minimum. With that in mind, I would want to dig the hole to dump the body in beforehand, and to make the location of the act and the hole close together. The choice of where to plan the crime, that I needed to be absolutely careful and thorough with. It had to be somewhere nobody would witness it, and a place with hiding places for a sneak attack. I could dig a hole for the body right there. I go over the possibilities in my head of the various destinations her uncle would head to from Sadako's house. I imagined a map of the area in my head, and then I found a place that fulfilled those conditions so easily it was almost unbelievable. A bit of a back road that went through the woods. I didn't think her uncle would go deeper into the mountains of uh, Yaguchi on a whim. If he was going somewhere, he'd pass through the woods first. And nobody used this back way unless they had something, at, uh, something to do at Sadako's house or one or two other places. This path was fantastically ideal, as few people used it. I would wait for him in these woods. Would an ambush actually be possible? I went into the trees and tried really hard hiding myself in a few places. It was extremely quiet. My senses could be sharpened here to their maximum amount. I didn't know where he'd come, but I'd wait right here for Sadako's uncle. I actually had some trouble coming to that decision. The question arose of whether I should somehow call the man out. Was there a risk I'd be taking by luring him here? That man made Sadako do the shopping and errands. He seldom left on his own business. He wouldn't leave unless I worked out a plan to force him to, would he? That was the question. Tomorrow was the Watanagashi festival. Would he go out for the festival, or would he stay inside? If he stayed inside, how would I drag him out of his house? That's right. Wouldn't he make Sadako go to the festival? Sadako would go to the festival. Meanwhile, I would call the man. This is the Okonomiya police station. We have the young lady from your house. Could you come and pick her up immediately? It didn't even have to be the police. This is the clinic. The young lady from your house has been injured. Please come and pick her up. Yes, that would work too. If I claimed to be the police or the hospital, told him to come and then hung up on him, he'd rush there trying to figure out what was going on, wouldn't he? And just the other day, he was visited by a probation officer. He wouldn't suddenly grumble about having to get his niece and not go. It would look like child neglect. The man had no skills useful around the house. Sadako, his slave, was an essential part of his daily life. Conclusion If he went out to the festival, I would attack him here on his way there or back. If he didn't, I would lure him out by phone. If luring him out by phone was my first step, I needed to be sure Sadako would go to the festival, leaving the house. It would be convenient if I could make Mio and take Sadako to the festival. She said her aunt was a district welfare officer. In other words, an ally to the probation officer. If I somehow incited Mio to take Sadako to the festival with her, well, being who she was, she would use that fact to get her there. See, the whole thing is, they're going to find it very suspicious that that uh, Keiichi's just going to, like, not go to the festival. So that alone is going to be weird. It's like, oh, Keiichi didn't go to the festival, and then the uncle just turned up missing. Sadako should just take a break and have fun at the festival with everyone. She should have a good time, reminisce on our former peaceful days, and when she went home, everything would be over. Yeah, that would be the best outcome. With that decided, I needed to dig a hole somewhere in the woods to hide the body. So it wouldn't stand out, so it wouldn't be found. Some place nobody would see me while I was completely exposed as I buried the corpse. I had wanted it to be close to the scene of the crime, but it naturally grew further away. Deep in the bosom of the black forest, the voices of the Higurashi were the only sounds here, informing me that people shouldn't indiscreetly step foot in this place. Digging a hole with so many tree roots crawling around the ground would be far more difficult than I'd envisioned. I snuck a gardening spade out here in my bag, but that wouldn't be enough. Still, as I looked into various approaches, I managed to find a place I could dig into. Tomorrow I'd bring a real shovel from the storeroom at home. I'd manage with that. I wondered how big a hole would have to be to fit a human all the way into it. I'd probably have to dig pretty deep down. 
but if I were slipshod in those efforts, I'd let a beginning occur. I absolutely couldn't allow that. Use any amount of time you need to. I mustn't spare any effort to utterly erase him. I glanced at my wristwatch. It was a little past six. This was probably all I was going to get done here for today. I really wanted to dig the hole in advance tonight, even if it got dark out, but Mom would be upset if I stayed out that late. It wouldn't be good to come off as suspicious to my parents. I needed to go back home and give Mion a call soon. I needed to get her to promise Sadako to take her by tonight. After that, today would be done. Done. Would it be, though? Was this really everything I could do to prepare right now? I decided where to kill him. I decided how to kill him. I decided, of course, how to dispose of the body. I didn't decide on a time, but I would play that by ear. I didn't have a way to decide that. Was that really all? Was this really all right? <laughs> Is this really all right to plan a murder? Hmm. Have I overlooked anything? Would this really go how I planned? Of course not, because it's Higurashi. And at the beginning, it said something about how this this particular chapter is basically going to be impossible to figure out. So of course it's not going to be that straightforward. After all this, worries started welling up one after another. It was only natural I'd be anxious. This would be the first and last big job of my lifetime. I could not allow failure, and I had no experience as this was my first time. I didn't have the know-how, the knack, so it was only natural I'd be anxious. The dark clouds of unease told me doing nothing would be the easiest way. A truly pathetic suggestion this late in the game. Have you forgotten how miserable Sadako looked? From the outside, it may have looked like I was resolute, but deep in my heart, my knees were shaking loudly. I mean, at least he's showing some sort of trepidation about this. I've never actually won a single fight to my satisfaction. Could I really kill someone? I may have been playing an ambush, but my enemy was large and far older than me. He had a scary face, and he looked like he was well accustomed to fighting. Could I have... All the pieces before and after the murder were perfectly planned. But was the actual murder, the most important part, what, en what unsettled me the most? It should be. Murdering someone should be the thing that makes you, gives you the most pause. All my preparations, all of my perfectly concealed machinations, if I didn't successfully murder him, they amounted to nothing. Damn it. After coming this far, you're pathetic, Keichi Maibara. If you start to have these kind of second thoughts, your ulterior motive will be obvious. Let's go home, go home and calm your mind. Tomorrow will be a juncture in your life, the likes of which graduation, employment, marriage, and childbirth couldn't hold a candle to. A day of murder. To kill someone. For someone else's sake. With that day behind us, we would take it back again. Those mild, spring-like days we never thought would stop. Those safe, peaceful, fun times. I pedaled my bicycle hard to get back home. I felt somehow unsteady. Like my body and soul weren't in alignment. A subtle shift between where the tips of my hands and feet really were and where I felt them to be. My vision was a little distant and narrow. As if the great barrier I risked my future life on had nothing to do with me. An unreal sensation. How could I put it? Everything was so far away. Fine. Feel your unease permeate you, Keichi Maibara. If that will turn your timidity into meticulousness and allow you to act with greater caution, then it's actually an important emotion to feel. This feeling I had never went away that night. It was the first time I'd be calling Mion's house. I searched for her in the phone book the school gave me, and dialed a short phone number, the kind unique to remote places. It was around dinner time. She would probably be home. But just as I started to think nobody would respond, someone finally picked up the receiver. Hi, Sonogaki desu. Ah, she seemed to be in a weirdly good mood and she drew her syllables out. 
Right. It's the night before tomorrow's festival, so she's probably with her family having some drinks. I heard her draw in a small breath on the other end. The scent of sake had completely disappeared from her voice. She's like, way to bring down my buzz, dude. So, Oh my god, Mion is definitely gonna know something's up. She's Keiichi's asking her to take Sadako to the festival, and then Keiichi's not going to go to the festival or he's gonna leave early. Mion's definitely gonna know that he's he's behind it if he does succeed in killing the uncle. Oh, Mion's too sharp. She's gonna, I wonder if she's gonna interrogate Keiichi and probably be like, you're planning something and I'm saying don't do it. I was having a little difficulty understanding what Mion was asking me. Oh, unless Mion's already planning on killing the uncle and she's like, I'm busy that night, I can't go. It's like they're both planning to kill the uncle, but they're trying to get the other person to like go to the festival. Mion was persistent about odd things. Yeah, you're one to talk, Keiichi. No, maybe it'd be better to say that she was sharp. Okay, G. Oh, so suspicious. She knows. Mion took a long time to give her reply. I got the feeling that Mion had been acting weird for a while now. Like she was flustered by emotions or something. No, it's because yeah. she it's because she knows you're gonna do you're gonna kill her. Or not her. She knows you're gonna kill the uncle and she's like, No, I'm not gonna let you do this. <laughs> huh? Was that a sob? Oh, she knows, and she's like, Don't throw your life away, don't do this, please. Mion? Are you crying? What? Mion, what was she talking about? I had no idea what to say to that. Mio was clearly now talking to someone other than me. I didn't know who. All I could do was listen to her in a daze. Oh. She's talking about him like she... Like he's Satoshi. I was thinking in my head, like, once again, I don't know if the possessions, if it's a thing that actually happens in these games, or if it's just, 
you know, it's something else. But maybe Mion thinks that, and I was thinking it too, maybe Keichi is being possessed by Satoshi in some way to protect Sadako, and maybe Mion seeing Satoshi in, in Keichi. <laughs> yes. And it's like they said, it's like, you don't sound like, like, are you actually Keichi? Like, maybe he started to sound like Satoshi, and maybe that's coming through? When I said her name, whatever spell was on Mion was released. Okay, that was weird. Oh. Oh, so Satoshi asked Mion to take Sadako to the festival, and then he disappeared. Oh, snap. Okay. We still don't know what, what actually happened to Satoshi. Mion didn't answer. All I could hear were sobs coming through the receiver. I had no idea how it happened, but I was pretty sure that last year on this very day, Satoshi had called Mion and told her to bring Sadako to the festival. And when she asked why he needed her to do it, he replied the same way I just did. <sighs> so maybe Satoshi killed the aunts, but then and but then the other guy confessed to it. <sighs> I still don't know what's going on with Satoshi. Like what happened to him that night? Where he is now? <laughs> I didn't expect this. I didn't either. Satoshi had given her the exact same phone call one year ago today. Mion kept going after that. That I, that he, was lying. And he told her it would only be for the night of the festival. Disappeared might have been a rather vague way to put it. Whether he ran away or not, Satoshi left, abandoning Sadako. And then an idea far more indistinct than even fog crossed my mind. Satoshi made exactly the same phone call as me last year. Why would Satoshi make the exact same call? If, in the truest sense, he ma really made the exact same phone call as I am right now, then the incident where their aunt was beaten to death. That's... could it... Satoshi... <laughs> last year, Sadako had been con uh, constantly abused by her uncle's wife, their aunt too. Her aunt abused her the most, and on that night, in the name of Oishiro-sama's curse, she was taken from this world. If I thought about that, everything made perfect sense, didn't it? Well, <laughs> now he's basically putting it out there what he was planning to do tomorrow. He's like, well, the ant was beaten. Satoshi called you. And that's what I'm planning on doing, too. <laughs> No, but that would mean... But then, Satoshi, he was a coward who abandoned Sadako and ran away, wasn't he? How could Satoshi resolve himself to kill a person, to save Sadako? It was unthinkable. A few days later, he disappeared. On Sadako's birthday. When I first heard it, I flew into a rage. What a cruel day to have run away on. Now that I thought about it like this, the story changed completely. 
Satoshi had probably been even less calm than I was now. He was her big brother, related by blood, watching his little sister be abused day in and day out. Maybe that's why he couldn't keep calm. And that was why the corpse of their aunt beaten to death was so easily discovered. Satoshi lost himself in his anger and hadn't hidden the corpse. He permitted a beginning to occur. If the police conducted a full-blown investigation, it was easy to imagine they wouldn't take long to pin down Satoshi as the culprit. Satoshi, he wished for a return to peaceful days with Sadako, and thought he achieved it for a time. He had been steadily driven into a corner. And then, he wanted to at least hold out until Sadako's birthday, but finally they nailed him. At the time, Satoshi had been carrying the savings he had amassed to buy Sadako a giant stuffed animal for a birthday present. He would buy the stuffed animal as her gift, and then get caught. Or he could use the money and disappear. That was the choice he had been forced to make and he decided not to make Sadako the sister of a murderer. If that was the case, then it must have been an unspeakably bitter decision. All that money he'd saved wanting to see Sadako happy, he had to use it to make her sad. And he used the savings, and disappeared to Tokyo if the rumors were true. Oishi? Had he been slowly driven into a corner by that repulsive man's pig-headed pursuit? Or, that's just them saying that to kind of, like, appease people that there was a, you know, otherwise people would think it was the curse. So maybe if they're like, well, we, you know, we got someone to confess, then it's just circumstantial. That was right. The deviant had confessed, and the incident was solved. Once again, he, he could have paid the guy. The money, he could have used that money, the, his savings, to get someone to kill the aunt, some random person, but... If that was the case, then if the person got caught by the cops, he would confess and be like, No, no, I got paid by someone to do it. You couldn't just arbitrarily decide like that. You never know where or how humans are tied together. If that guy took the blame, then it was the perfect crime. Of course, if it was really a perfect crime, there would have been no reason for Satoshi to vanish. サトシに渡航資金なんてなかったと思う。サトシが預金を下ろした日、これは誰に言っても信じてくれないんだけど、サトコのために買うと言ってたぬいぐるみが売れて証券室からなくなってたの。きっとサトシが買ったに違いない。
In the end, it was the same, but I was happy for that slight difference. You just gave away your hand, dude. There already might be a beginning because you talked to me on. We apologize to each other for a little bit. As if interrupting our parting words, Mion struck straight where it hurt. I deflected her with a response that wasn't really an answer. Mion didn't hound me anymore after that. No, she knows. She knows. Click. Satoshi Hojo. Just who are you? I, scor uh, I scorned you as a coward who ran away abandoning his sister. I always thought you didn't have the right to call yourself her Nini. But now I didn't know what to think. Oya Shirasama's curse on the fourth year, their aunt's death, and Satoshi's disappearance. And now me, trying to carry out Oya Shirasama's curse on the fifth. Oddly enough, what I was going to do overlapped perfectly with Satoshi, the day before the curse. No, that wasn't all. If we start back from Sadako being abused, then I'd been overlapping with Satoshi for days already. When I talked to Mion before, she asked me if I was Satoshi. If that was the first impression a third party like Mion got, then it was probably true. Then a Satoshi had accomplished, I would succeed in the murder. But that was the extent to which we overlapped. I was far calmer than Satoshi, and more calculating. I could actually grow calmer the more enthusiastic I became. That's why I wouldn't follow in Satoshi's footsteps. I would snip him cleanly out of the world, and then get our peaceful life back. Maybe Satoshi had been with me ever since I chose to use Satoshi's bat as my weapon. No, maybe even longer than that. When I decided I'd be her Nini, maybe Satoshi had been residing with me then, too. Satoshi. Were you really a coward? Or are you a true Nini even now, the kind worthy of Satoko's love? I'd never met him, never spoken to him, didn't even know his face, and yet I felt so connected to him. I'd never felt that way before. Alright, so we got one more tip and then we will wrap up this episode for the attention of those on the housewife slaughter incident case. July blank, 1982. Okonomiya Police Station, 1st Investigative Division. Chief Tagasugi. Blank Prefecture Police Headquarters for the Eradication of Drug-Related Crime. Shishibone Branch Head. Regarding incident blank designated as undercover investigation. This message is to inform you that a section of the testimony records of an incident under this police headquarters jurisdiction has been found. That is thought to be related to the undercover investigation of the incident in question, Okonomiya Police Station X, Hinimizawa Village, Housewife Slaughter Incident. During investigation of suspect Blank, who was arrested for possession of illegal drugs, there was testimony related to the crime in question, and as part of it, we learned the criminal had information only, uh, only he could have known. Therefore, this record of testimony, duplicate attached, will be provided to you. If this testimonial is to be believed, then there is an extremely high chance that suspect Blank was the culprit behind the incident in question. In addition, the head investigator on the case received this report and inquired as to the in uh, incident with the Okonomiya Police Station. But the responsible party at Okonomiya Station who responded to the designated undercover investigation announced by the Prefectural Police uh, Police's General Director on July 1, 1982, Osamu Fu uh, Fusakane, B-112, misunderstood. 
and did not explain the incident's existence to the head investigator on the case properly. Because of this, the case's head investigator was not aware of the importance of the testimonies related to the case in question. And as a result, was negligent when combing the scene. We apologize for having left it in the dark until now. In addition, there is a postscript stating that suspect blank died while in confinement yesterday on XXX. Okay, the plot thickens. All right, guys, so that will wrap up this very depressing episode of Higurashi. I hope you enjoyed. We didn't get to the Watanagashi Festival in this episode, but next one it seems like it's going to happen. But the question is, will the murder happen? I am so curious to know how this is going to go. Like, is he going to go through with it? Is he going to, you know, back out at the last second? Is something insane going to happen? Probably yes, but you'll just have to stay tuned for the next episode to find out. So thank you guys so much for watching once again, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.